In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Queen of the family, pray for us. in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. This final conference, we reach the highest and most perfect expression of our faith, namely the sacred liturgy and a consideration of the preparation for holy matrimony. The family is the incomparable fruit of the marriage of a man and a woman. In reflecting with you on the mystery of holy matrimony, I now concentrate on the pastoral care of those who are preparing for marriage has a key to understanding how best to serve pastorally the family. It is clear that the husband and wife who understand as fully as possible the grace conferred in the sacrament of holy matrimony and who faithfully respond to that grace will form a home which is indeed the domestic church according to the perennial understanding of the church. They will form a strong and healthy first cell of the life of the church and thus build up the whole church, not only in their parish and diocese, but universally. I quote the teaching on holy matrimony in the dogmatic constitution on the church of the Second Vatican Ecumenical Council. In virtue of the sacrament of matrimony by which they signify and share the mystery of the unity and faithful love between Christ and the Church, Christian married couples help one another to attain holiness in their married life and in the rearing of their children. Hence, by reason of their state in life and of their position, they have their own gifts in the people of God. From the marriage of Christians, there comes the family in which new citizens of human society are born, and by the grace of the Holy Spirit in baptism, Those are made children of God, so that the people of God may be perpetuated throughout the centuries. In what might be regarded as the domestic church, the parents, by word and example, are the first heralds of the faith with regard to their children. They must foster the vocation which is proper to each child, and this with special care, if it be to religion." That's uh, taken from the Dogmatic Constitution, Lumen Gentium on the Church, and that is in number 11. Regarding Christian marriage in the family, Pope St. John Paul II, in his post-synodal apostolic exhortation, Familiaris Consortio, declared that the Christian family, in fact, is the first community called to announce the gospel to the human person during growth, and to bring him or her through a progressive education and catechesis to full human and Christian maturity. And that, of course, has to do with helping each child in the family, the parents have a special responsibility to help the child to know his or her vocation in life. This has oftentimes been forgotten in these last decades, but this should be uh, very much in our minds as we're raising our children and noting the multiple and grievous attacks on marriage and the family in our time, Pope John Paul II stressed the importance of witnessing to the truth about marriage and the family. And I, I quoted to you this, to you this morning uh, that text from Familiaris Consortio in which the Holy Father urged, especially at this moment in history, a very strong witness on the part of families. In the present moment, when the attacks on matrimony and the family seem the most ferocious, it is, as I stated this morning, the church who must show to the whole of society the truth in all its richness, and therefore the beauty and goodness of marriage and the family. The church accomplishes this mission of evangelization of the family with its teaching, and we've concentrated very strongly on that this morning, and now with, we take up with the celebration of the sacraments and with the life of prayer and devotion and with its discipline. 
The sources of my presentation are the sacred liturgy and the code of canon law. These two sources are the expression of the doctrinal truth of marriage as God created it from the, from the beginning. Attending to them, we will attend to that unchanging truth, which is a participation in the very being of God in his incomparable beauty and goodness. The sacred liturgy. The sacred liturgy, the public prayer of the church, is God's greatest gift to us. Through the sacred liturgy, the glorious Christ, seated at the right hand of the Father, truly comes into our midst to purify our hearts of all sin and to inflame them with divine love. It makes present, therefore, the mystery of faith, the mystery of God's immeasurable and unceasing love for us, which reached its fullness in the redemptive incarnation of God the Son. Regarding the sacred liturgy, the fathers of the Second Vatican Ecumenical Council declared, For it is in the liturgy through which, especially in the divine sacrifice of the Eucharist, the work of our redemption is accomplished. And it is through the liturgy, especially, that the faithful are enabled to express in their lives and manifest to others the mystery of Christ and the real nature of the true church. Uh, There are many examples in our own time of persons who have been, uh, have received the first grace of coming into the full communion of the church or of conversion through uh, being present at the celebration of the sacred liturgy. The church is essentially both human and divine, visible but endowed with invisible realities, zealous in action and dedicated to contemplation, present in the world but as a pilgrim, so constituted that in her the human is directed toward and subordinated to the divine, the visible to the invisible, action to contemplation, and this present world to the city yet to come, the object of our quest. The liturgy daily builds up those who are in the church, making of them a holy temple of the Lord, a dwelling place of God in the Spirit, to the mature measure of the fullness of Christ. At the same time, it marvelously increases their power to preach Christ and thus to show forth the church, a sign lifted up among the nations to those who are outside, a sign under which the scattered children of God may be gathered together until there is one fold and one shepherd. Through the sacred liturgy, Christ bids us to give our hearts to him, so that through, with, and in him, we may worship God in spirit and truth. From our hearts, united to his most sacred heart, flow rivers of living water for all our brothers and sisters. According to the ancient wisdom of the church, the sacred liturgy is a privileged witness of the apostolic tradition. The church's wisdom is expressed in an adage of Prosper of Aquitaine, The law of praying establishes the law of believing. We can add that the law of praying also establishes the law of acting. Since the sacred liturgy is the highest and most perfect expression of our life in Christ, we rightly turn to the sacred rites in order to understand more deeply the holiness of the Christian life in its every aspect. The sacred liturgy remains the essential source of our understanding of the faith um, and of its practice in a good and holy life. Canon law. Canon law exists for one only reason, to safeguard and promote the sacred realities of our life in Christ. Pope St. John Paul II pursued with vigor the revision of the 1917 Code of Canon Law, in order to fulfill the desire of the fathers of the Second Vatican Ecumenical Council that the perennial discipline of the Church be addressed to the present time. Clearly, the Council's desire regarding Church discipline did not intend the the abandonment of her discipline, but a new appreciation of it in the context of contemporary challenges. In the Apostolic Constitution, Sacre Discipline Leges, with which he, the supreme legislator in the Church, promulgated the 1983 Code of Canon Law, he wrote, 
Turning our minds today to the beginning of this long journey, the journey of the revision of the Code of Canon Law, to that January 25th, 1959, when my predecessor of happy memory, John the 23rd, announced for the first time his decision to reform the existing corpus of canonical legislation, which had been promulgated on the Feast of Pentecost in the year 1917, and to John the 23rd himself, who initiated the revision of the code, I must recognize that this code derives from one and the same intention, the renewal of Christian living. From such an intention, in fact, the entire work of the Council, the Second Vatican Council, drew its norms and its direction. These words point to the essential service of canon law, to our living in Christ with the engagement and energy of the first disciples. Canonical discipline is directed to the pursuit at all times of holiness of life. The saintly pontiff described the nature of canon law, indicating its organic development from God's first covenant with his holy people. He recalled the distant patrimony of law contained in the books of the Old and New Testament, from which is derived the whole juridical legislative tradition of the Church as from its first source. In particular, he reminded the Church how Christ himself declared that he had not come to abolish the law, but to bring it to completion, teaching us that it is, in fact, the discipline of the law, which opens the way to freedom in loving God and our neighbor. He observed, Thus the writings of the New Testament enable us to understand even better the importance of discipline and make us see better how it is more closely connected with the saving character of the evangelical message itself. Pope John Paul II then articulated the purpose of canon law, that is, the service of faith and grace, and of the gifts of the Holy Spirit and charity. He noted that far from hindering the living of our life in Christ, canonical discipline safeguards and fosters our Christian life. He declared, Its purpose is rather to create such an order in the ecclesial society that while assigning the primacy to love, grace, and charisms, it at the same time renders their organic development easier in the life of both the ecclesial society and of the individual persons who belong to it. As such, canon law can never be in conflict with the Church's doctrine, but is, in the words of John Paul II, extremely necessary for the Church. The teaching of the Church, in fact, is translated into discipline by the canonical tradition. He indicated four ways in which the Church's discipline is a necessary complement to her doctrine, declaring, Since the Church is organized as a social and visible structure, it must also have norms. In order that its hierarchical and organic structure be visible, in order that the ex exercise of the functions divinely entrusted to it, especially that of sacred power and of the administration of the sacraments, may be adequately organized, in order that the mutual relations of the faithful may be regulated according to justice based upon charity, with the rights of individuals guaranteed and well-defined, in order, finally, that common initiatives undertaken to live a Christian life ever more perfectly may be sustained, strengthened, and fostered by canonical norms. Because of the essential service of canon law to the life of the Church, Pope John Paul II reminded the Church that by their very nature, canonical laws are to be observed. And to that end, the wording of the norms should be accurate and based on solid juridical, canonical, and theological foundations. The Sacred Liturgy and Marriage In the current discussion regarding holy matrimony, and in particular its intrinsic indissolubility, it is frequently asserted that a great percentage of marriages are surely null. The reason given is the highly secularized culture in which we live. 
Secularization denies the natural law, which teaches us that marriage is a faithful, enduring, and procreative union, that it is a faithful and enduring union between one man and one woman. The argument is that many parties who exchange marriage consent today do not understand to what they are consenting and therefore exclude from their consent one or more of the essential goods of marriage, unity, indissolubility, and procreativity. Given the pervasive practice of no-fault divorce, it is, in particular, it is asserted that many parties affected by what is called the divorcist mentality exclude by a positive act of the will the indissolubility or permanence of the marriage bond. Whereas in the church's discipline, marriage always enjoys the favor of the law, that is, consent to marriage is presumed to be valid unless the contrary is proven with moral certitude, some today would hold that marriage consent in as many as 50% of cases can be presumed to be null or invalid. The first argument, in fact, against the presumption of nullity of marriage consent is human nature itself, as we were been discussing this morning. It is the law which God has written in every human part, heart, as St. Paul reminds us in his letter to the Romans. This is from chapter 2, verses 14 to 16. When Gentiles who have not the law do by nature what the law requires, they are a law to themselves even though they do not have the law. They show that what the law requires is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or perhaps excuse them on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. No one denies that a profoundly secularized culture has a negative effect on the giving of true matrimonial consent and on the living of the consent in practice. But that does not mean that young people today do not understand what marriage truly is and desire it in itself. To assert that they do not know the natural moral law is, in fact, to deny human nature, which teaches the truth about life, marriage as the cradle of human life, and our relationship with God, which expresses itself in worship of him. A second strong argument in the case of Catholics and non-Catholics who celebrate their marriages according to the rite of marriage in the Roman ritual is the reflection of the truth about marriage in sacred worship, and in particular, in the rite of marriage. In other words, the truth of the faith finds its highest and most perfect expression in the sacred liturgy. It is difficult, then, to comprehend how one can celebrate liturgically the sacrament of holy matrimony without understanding and embracing its truth which finds its highest and most perfect expression in the liturgical rite. For that reason, I think it particularly important to consider the truth about marriage as it is expressed in the sacred liturgy, and in particular in the rite of marriage of the Roman ritual. Although a second revised edition of the rite of marriage, reformed after the Second Vatican Ecumenical Council, was promulgated by the Congregation for Divine Worship and the Discipline of the Sacraments on March 19, 1990. To the best of my knowledge, an official English translation has not yet been approved and printed. According to the degree of promulgation, decree of promulgation, the revised edition is richer in the introduction, in the rites and prayers, since some variations have been added according to the norms of the Code of Canon Law, promulgated in 1983. Since the English edition of the Rite of Marriage in use corresponds to the first edition promulgated by the Sacred Congregation for Rites on March 19, 1969, I will follow it. It is my hope that soon the official English version of the revised second edition will be published. 
In any case, there is no contradiction between the fundamental content of the two editions, although the revised second edition, as the decree of promulgation indicates, is much richer in its contents, especially in the contents of the introduction. Also, it must be noted that the English translation of the first edition suffers from the defects of the translation method called dynamic equivalency, which were addressed by the fifth instruction on vernacular translation of the Roman liturgy, Liturgium Authenticum, published by the Congregation for Divine Worship and the Discipline of the Sacraments on March 28, 2001. First, I will treat the introduction, what is called the prenotanda of the rite of marriage, and then consider some of the individual elements of the rite. It is my hope that my treatment will show how the sacred liturgy is the greatest teacher of the truth about marriage and, therefore, a safeguard against an invalid celebration of the sacrament of holy matrimony through the exclusion of one of the essential goods of marriage. More fundamentally and importantly, it is, the liturgical rite itself, it, it is the source of grace for the formation of the family as the domestic church. The introduction to the rite of marriage. The introduction to the rite of marriage is divided into four parts which treat the importance and dignity of the sacrament of matrimony, the choice of rite, the preparation of local rituals, and the right to prepare a completely new right. I will consider them in turn. The treatment of the importance and dignity of the sacrament of matrimony provides four essential points of catechesis regarding marriage and then three exhortations to the priest who officiates at the marriage. The first point, taken directly from the teaching of the Second Vatican Ecumenical Council, expresses the nature of marriage. It states, Married Christians, in virtue of the sacrament of matrimony, signify and share in the mystery of that unity and fruitful love which exists between Christ and his Church. They help each other to attain to holiness in their married life and in the rearing and education of their children, and they have their own special gift among the people of God. Marriage, as the first account of creation in the book of Genesis makes clear, is a participation in the very life of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and therefore reflects the divine love for man, which found its consummation in the redemptive incarnation. The participation of spouses in divine love is expressed in two ways, in helping each other to grow in holiness and thus to attain eternal salvation, and in procreating and educating children made in God's own image and likeness. The first point concludes with the words of St. Paul concerning the distinct gift which the married life is in the church. The second point describes how marriage is constituted by the covenant or irrevocable consent which each partner freely bestows on and accepts from the other. Marriage is the only sacrament in which the, the parties are the ministers of the sacrament to one another. The, the priest officiates, he witnesses their consent, but they are the ministers of the sacrament. <clears throat> It then articulates the fidelity and indissolubility which such a union by its very nature requires, and Christ's elevation of the marital union to the dignity of a sacrament, so that it might more clearly recall and more easily reflect his own unbreakable union with his church. In the third point, the married, the married are urged to nourish and develop their marriage by undivided affection, which wells up from the fountain of divine love, while in a merging of human and divine love, they remain faithful in body and in mind, in good times as in bad. The married share in divine love, which is faithful and enduring. The unity and indissolubility of their union has its font in the very life of God communicated to them at the creation 
and brought to its perfection by the coming of God the Son in our human nature and by his passion, death, resurrection, and ascension. The fourth point stresses the inherent ordering of Christian marriage to the procreation and education of children who are, and the text quotes a text from the the pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world, which calls the the procreation and education of children the ultimate crown of the love of spouses. The text declares, Therefore, married Christians, while not considering the other purposes of marriage less of less account, should be steadfast and ready to cooperate with the love of the Creator and Savior, who through them will constantly enrich and enlarge his own family. The essential good of marriage expressed in this point must be given prime attention in a society which strives to exclude artificially the good of offspring from the conjugal embrace. The fifth, sixth, and seventh points are directed to the priest. The fifth point instructs the priest to illustrate the just described truths about marriage, both through his preparation of the couple for marriage and in his homily during the rite of matrimony. Actually, the contents of marriage preparation are found in the very rite in this introduction, and they should be what the priest is illustrating for the couple in their preparation, and then again, what he underlines in his homily during the rite. And and the homily is not an option. The priest must give a homily during the celebration of the rite of marriage. Such instruction, both in the pre-marriage preparation and in the homily during the rite, as the introduction indicates, will help the bridegroom and the bride to receive far greater benefit from the celebration. The sixth point under the sixth point, uh, we, we, the fifth point was telling the priest, please use these elements for the marriage preparation and in your homily. And then the sixth point underlines for the priest the instructive or catechetical nature of the rite itself. And I quote it in, in its entirety. In the celebration of marriage, which normally should be within Mass, certain elements should be stressed, especially the liturgy of the Word, which shows the importance of Christian marriage in the history of salvation and the duties and responsibility of the couple in caring for the holiness of their children. Also of supreme importance are the consent of the contracting parties, which the priest asks and receives the special nuptial blessing for the bride and the marriage and the married co- marriage covenant and finally the reception of holy communion by the groom and the bride and by all present by which their love is nourished and all are lifted up into the communion with our lord and one another the central elements of the rite of marriage are thus indicated the liturgy of the word the exchange of consent the nuptial blessing and the participation in the Eucharistic sacrifice, which reaches its completion in the reception of Holy Communion, the incomparable fruit of the sacrifice. The marriage of two baptized Catholics finds its natural setting in the celebration of the Eucharistic sacrifice, which is the highest expression of our life in Christ and the perfect reflection of the divine life in which the married couple is called to participate. I must say I think that one of the unfortunate developments in the reform which took place in the sacred liturgy after the Second Vatican Council was a a kind of of casualness about the rite of marriage and also a very unhealthy uh, concentration on the the personalities of the couples. I've been present at marriages and in which there is, to put it plainly, a lot of carrying on about the about the bridegroom and the and the bride. This is strictly inappropriate. What is happening here is is a sacred uh, union is being formed, and the concentration should be on the reading of the Word of God. The homily should concentrate on the exposition of the of the Word of God, and and, and on what is about to take place, the consent. I mean, actually, uh, I've been present at weddings in which the exchange of consent is done in a kind of uh, 
careless way with laughing and so forth. I mean, I can't imagine uh, what could be more more inappropriate, and a priest must certainly guard against that. And with the secularization being what it is today, it's true that, that some couples take very lightly the marriage ceremony. That's why you have to insist with them on confession the night before. And, and I, I always, when I was a parish priest, gave them a very strict admonition about getting to bed early and especially about not uh, exaggerating exaggerating in the use of alcohol and so forth. But I actually had the experience from time to time of wedding parties which arrived in the church uh, with, with, with alcoholic beverages. I mean, this is, so all of these things, one has to be very concrete and direct today because, unfortunately, uh, we aren't, our young people are not raised and catechized properly and, and they can be caught up in the, in the horrible um, disdain, really, of the sacredness of marriage by our culture. Sorry to have gone off on that, but... <laughs> Uh, the seventh point reads priests should first of all strengthen and nourish the faith of those about to be married for the sacrament of matrimony presupposes and demands faith in preparing couples for marriage the priest should study the rite of marriage with them as a means to deepen their faith in general and their faith in holy matrimony in particular this is especially important today because a couple can arrive, who are even two, two Catholics, and they may not know practically anything about their Catholic faith. I mean, that's just the sad tale of, of our time. And the priest, and they'll be impatient about this. Well, that's just fine. They can be impatient. But the priest needs to, to catechize them. It's for their own good. Hmm. Sometimes the question is, is raised, and I, I addressed that a little bit this morning, about how much faith is required to enter a valid marriage. The answer is the fundamental understanding of the reality of marriage as God created it from the beginning and the acceptance of the call to marriage in one's own life. The fullness of faith or perfect faith is not required. If it were, then it would be impossible for many to enter a valid marriage which is clearly contrary to the will of God. The faith of the couple, by their day-to-day cooperation with God's grace, will grow in perfection throughout a lifetime. For those of you who are married, I'm sure that your faith today has a much deeper uh, knowledge and uh, and a, a much greater engagement than it did on the day of your marriage, and that is only natural and right. I, I trust, too, that that uh, that my faith is deeper, my commitment to the, to the priestly vocation is, is more, more ardent and, and engaged than it was on the day of my ordination. Not that it wasn't on the day of my ordination, but we, we grow and develop as we live uh, our vocation. And surely the Christian spouses must intend what the church intends by holy matrimony, which is not different in its essence from the natural sacrament although it is enriched and perfected by sacramental grace. If those intending to marry demonstrate that they do not intend to do what the church intends in witnessing their marriage, then as as Pope St. John Paul II instructed in Familiaris Consortio, and I quote, the pastor of souls cannot admit them to the celebration of marriage. Uh, that would simply be sacrilegious to admit a couple to celebrate marriage who don't intend what the church intends. Monsignor Cormac Burke, uh, in his magisterial commentary on the question, observed, this is contained in a book which he wrote, a very fine book, The Theology of Marriage, Personalism, Doctrine, and Canon Law. He, he's not my relative. I'd be proud if he was, but I, I can't claim him. Uh, he was for many years a judge of the Rota, and not infrequently canon lawyers would say, oh, I've read many of your decisions, and I said, no, you haven't. <laughs> uh, but this is what Monsignor Cormac Burke wrote. 
John Paul II does not use the phrase, and he's talking about familiaris consortio, what the church does. Normally we say that about the sacraments. You have to intend uh, what the church does. And if you baptize intending what the church does when she baptizes, that makes the salad, sacrament valid. But marriage is distinct because it's the parties who are, who are confecting the sacrament, who are, who are realizing the sacrament. Uh, and there's not an external uh, involvement uh, on the part of the church. The priest witnesses it, but the parties, this has to do with the fact, too, that marriage is a natural sacrament. Uh, so John Paul II does not use the phrase what the church does, quod facet ecclesia, but rather he speaks of what it intends. This indeed seems the only accurate way to refer to the matter. While the church does nothing in the sacrament, it, insofar as it is present or aware of the marriage taking place, no doubt intends something that two Christians marry. It intends, in other words, a marriage between two persons who are in Christ. The question is this. Do the spouses intend what the church intends? Do the spouses intend to marry in Christ? If they intend to marry, they do, because in virtue of their baptism, they are in Christ. They intend what the church intends, just as the church intends what they intend. And so they have a sufficient sacramental intention. It would not be accurate to say that the church wants them to be married as Christians, for they are Christians. Though one could say the church wants them to be married so as to receive help to be better Christians. The second subject of the introduction is the choice of right. There are two rites of marriage, the right of celebrating marriage during Mass and the right of celebrating marriage outside Mass. The first rite is always to be celebrated for two baptized Catholics. It would be absolutely an anomalous for two Catholics to want to have their marriage celebrated outside of Mass. I, I've had that request from time to time, and that does reveal a serious lack of catechesis. In the case of marriage between a Catholic and a baptized person who is not Catholic, normally the second rite is chosen because of the general impossibility of the non-Catholic party to receive Holy Communion. The, the ordinary of the place can give permission for the use of the first rite in such a case, but Holy Communion is not given to the non-Catholic party. In the case of the marriage of a Catholic and a non-baptized person, the second rite is always used if the, if the other party is not baptized. Whatever rite is chosen, priests should show special consideration to those who take part in liturgical celebrations or hear the gospel only on the occasion of a wedding, either because they are not Catholics or because they are Catholics who rarely, if ever, take part in the Eucharist or seem to have abandoned the practice of the faith. The rite of marriage, and many people come to the celebration of a marriage who wouldn't step foot in a church otherwise. And uh, uh, so there they are, and uh, <laughs> it's, it's time to address a word to them. The, the rite itself should speak to them, but uh, 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 a word from the priest, and it doesn't have to be addressed to them explicitly, but by his very preaching and so forth, there will be uh, an evangelization the rite of marriage is the occasion for everyone to deepen his consciousness of the natural law and to refine his conscience in obedience to the truth written in his human nature. The Holy Scriptures and their exposition in the homily are particularly efficacious in illustrating divine truth revealed both by reason and by faith. Sometimes it was said to me, Oh, Father, don't bother with preparing that very careful homily. The bride and groom aren't paying any attention. So what I like to do then is give them a copy, and then one day they will pay attention if they weren't. <laughs> on the, but on the other hand, there's the whole congregation there, and it should be clear to the congregation what's happening. And if you simply engage in in you know in familiar talk about the personalities of the parties and their particular uh, ways and so forth, 
It's all lost. It's all lost. Of course, the whole matter of the celebration of the rite of marriage, as it is conducted by the priest, well, that was interesting, you know, excuse me a minute, uh, in the... In the extraordinary form of the rite of marriage, there is a prepared text for the homily. And actually, it's quite beautiful. Are you, you're a priest, I think. You, you must... No, you, you looked like a priest. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, maybe you missed your calling. <laughs> Just... Uh, um, there was a prepared text, and it's beautiful, and it illustrates all of these points. And I sometimes used it in celebrating the ordinary form because it, it's pretty not, it's hard to do better. But in any case, uh, the whole matter of the celebration of the rite of marriage as, as it is conducted by the priest acting in the person of Christ, head and shepherd of the flock in every time and place, should manifest the divine reality present. The manner of the priest should reflect the truth that it is Christ who unites the couple in the sacrament of holy matrimony through their mutual exchange of consent. The section on the choice of right provides other liturgical norms and concludes with a strong emphasis on the liturgy of the word, which is part of both rites of marriage. And in both rites, both within Mass and outside of Mass, they, the liturgy of the word, the homily, the exchange of consent, and the nuptial blessing are, are all uh, integral to the right. Um, there is a section then on preparation of local rituals, and it treats possible adaptations of the right of marriage, which are suitable for the customs and needs of individual areas. Uh, this has to do mo- mostly with missionary areas, and such adaptations must be recognized by the apostolic see. What is clear is, and th- what the 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 introduction makes very clear is that the essential parts of the rite of marriage must be preserved even if their arrangement is varied. Regarding the cases of nations which are undergoing a first evangelization, according to the introduction, whatever is good and is not indissolubly bound up with superstition and error should be sympathetically considered and, if possible, preserved intact. The introduction makes it clear, however, that anything admitted into the liturgy itself must ha- harmonize with its true and authentic spirit, namely, uh, of, of the divine reality. Such decisions clearly must be made with the greatest care and consideration, taking into account the principles of the liturgical rite and the profound meaning of any element taken from the pagan culture. Uh, today, for instance, in, in, in some places, there was a great uh, uh, urging of using local dances or what do they call it, liturgical movement um, uh, in the liturgy. And I remember that there was at the beatification of a blessed Teresa of Calcutta uh, a certain dancing. And I remember the, an, an Indian archbishop visiting me in St. Louis who, who expressed, I expressed to my wonderment and that Mother Teresa of Calcutta was not someone who was a favoring liturgical dance. And I expressed my wonderment, and he was very agitated because he said the dance that was introduced, which was from their local Indian culture, he said was full of pagan uh, meanings, and it should never have been, should never have been used in the, in the sacred liturgy. I had to be very careful about these things. The last section of the introduction, right to prepare a completely new rite, allows the Conference of Bishops to draw up a rite of marriage which must be approved by the Apostolic See. One condition is given. The rite must always conform to the law that the priest assisting at such marriages must ask for and receive the consent of the contracting parties, and the nuptial blessing should always be given. Uh, I think here, uh, even today, Uh, In the church, sometimes couples want to make up their own uh, exchange of consent. No. Um, Because uh, the the words of consent are very carefully uh, formed to express the essence of the exchange which is taking taking place. And and once we get into all kinds of of other language, it's, it's just trouble. 
And then there, there's a question, too, about a marriage in the home, uh, uh, which is a practice in some places uh, here in, in, in this country. Uh, oftentimes, again, at the influence of the secular culture, people want to have marriages by the riverside and or in the park and, or somewhere else, and that's simply... Uh, generally speaking, never permitted. The marriage should take place in the church. It's a sacred celebration, and uh, that's uh, that's where it should be celebrated. Um, the I would like to just comment on one thing that comes to my mind that uh, I hope to have done a, an article on this, which I hope to publish, but it's sometimes asserted uh, by people that that Saint Joseph and the Blessed Mother were not married at the time of the Annunciation. I even found this uh, assertion in a in what was normally speaking a kind of popular catechetical text, and which is was uh, fairly sound in every other respect. And you know, people say, "Well, Mary was the first unwed mother." Uh, Mary and Joseph were fully married. According to the Jewish ritual, there were two stages of marriage, but the first stage constituted the marriage, and they were considered married. That's why in the Gospel of Matthew, when our Lord discovers that Mary uh, is with child, he, he considers to divorce her, to put her aside. Well, if he wasn't married to her, he wouldn't need to divorce her. And so, uh, But people confuse today these two, <laughs> these two stages... People can confuse these two stages of the Jewish wedding practice with what we call engagement in marriage, and that wasn't it at all. The first part was called betrothal, but it was marriage. And it's the, the couple were married, the contract was fully binding, and then at some time, not too much later, then they, they took up uh, their, their uh, common house, their common home. So I just want to make that very clear to you in case any of you have heard this said. It, it, it simply is, is, is not true. And this article, which I hope to publish, there are many beautiful aspects that uh, uh, to be drawn from uh, the, the insistence on the marriage of, of the Blessed Mother and St. Joseph. Now, uh, just a brief treatment of the central uh, elements of the rite of marriage. The first of the central elements of the rite of marriage is the liturgy of the word, which is usually composed of three readings. The first reading from the Old Testament, a reading from the New Testament books other than the Gospels, and a reading from the Gospels. Be a very easy first reading that we had today, the Gospel that we had today, and from the New Testament, the letter to the Ephesians chapter 5. Wouldn't that make a beautiful set of readings for, for the for the wedding, but you could also have the wedding feast of Cana for the gospel. Uh, the rite of marriage, in fact, contains a selection of recommended scriptural texts. Given the importance of the choice of scriptural texts to instruct the hearts of the faithful and quicken their faith, special provisions are made for the selection of the texts. And it's even permitted on some Sundays if a marriage is taking place on a Sunday and it's not a, taking place at the parish mass. Uh, and it's not one of the major solemnities of the church year, then the rite even per- permits on a Sunday to choose the special readings for the rite of marriage. And, of course, they're always all from the Holy Scriptures. And then the rite of marriage requires the homily of the priest with these words. After the gospel, the priest gives a homily drawn from the sacred text. He speaks about the mystery of Christian marriage, the dignity of wedded love, the grace of the sacrament, and the responsibilities of married people, keeping in mind the circumstance of this particular marriage. In other words, the homily should be centered upon the action of Christ in the rite of marriage, uniting the couple in faithful, lifelong, and procreative love, and conferring upon them the grace to live fully the mystery of that love. The second central element is the heart of the rite of marriage, the questioning of the parties regarding their intention and the actual exchange of consent before God and his minister, the priest or deacon. 
The public nature of marriage is clear. It is a lasting state of life assumed in the Church and in the presence of the Church's minister and witnesses. In the introduction given by the priest, he declares, Christ has already consecrated you in baptism, and now he enriches and strengthens you by a special sacrament so that you may assume the duties of marriage in mutual and lasting fidelity. The priest then asks three questions which touch upon the essence of the consent in order to make clear its meaning before the parties actually exchange consent, sealing the covenant of their conjugal love. The last question regarding the acceptance of children can be omitted in the case of a couple who are advanced in years or in the case of a couple, one or both of whom are sterile. The questions are addressed to the parties by name, by both of their names. The question is, have you come here freely? You stay the person's name. John, have you come here freely and without reservation to give yourself Give yourselves to each other in marriage. The second question, I mean, John and Jane, excuse me, have you come here freely? And the second question, will you love and honor each other as man and wife for the rest of your lives? Will you accept children lovingly from God and bring them up according to the law of Christ and his church? The questions leave no question regarding the nature of the consent which the parties are about to exchange. It would be very difficult to imagine that a couple who just responded to these three questions didn't know what they were doing. Marriage consent, with its clear meaning of the giving and accepting of each other totally and for life, can be exchanged either by each of the parties repeating the formula of consent or by the priest repeating the formula and asking each of the parties to consent with the words, I do. The formula reads, I, John, take you, Jane, to be my wife. I promise to be true to you in good times and in bad, in sickness and in health. I will love you and honor you all the days of my life. The catechism, and then the same for the, the bride, The Catechism of the Catholic Church describes marriage consent with these words, inspired by the pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world of the Second Vatican Council, the rite of marriage, and the sacred scriptures. It draws from all these three sources, uh, from the sacred scriptures. They actually draw from the account of creation in the book of Genesis, the word of Christ in the gospel, and St. Paul's teaching contained in the letter to the Ephesians. This is the quote. The consent consists in a human act by which the partners mutually give themselves to each other. I take you to be my wife. I take you to be my husband. This, this consent binds the spouses to each other. Spi- that binds, this consent that binds the spouses to each other finds its fulfillment in the two becoming one flesh. Uh, That's uh, number 1627 from the Catechism. Through both the questioning before the exchange of consent and the exchange of consent itself, the marriage, the nature of marriage is clearly evident. It would be difficult to imagine someone not being able to understand the meaning of the words and therefore thinking that he is entering some other kind of relationship. In any case, the exchange of consent establishes the presumption of its validity. The contrary must be proven. The blessing and exchange of rings immediately following the exchange of consent gives powerful expression to the new reality constituted by God's grace. The two have become one flesh. The third central element of the rite of marriage is the nuptial blessing. It takes place after the Lord's Prayer. Three possible formulas for the blessing are provided in the English translation, while only one formula is given in the original Latin text. It is the first formula given in the English translation. In each of the formulas, God's blessing is called down upon the bride and her bridegroom in order that they may always respond more generously to the grace of the sacrament which they have just received. In all three formulas, two realities contained in the sacrament of holy matrimony are underlined. The grace to be faithful and enduring in love of each other as husband and wife, and the crown of their mutual love in the gift of children. 
The first formula reads in part, Father, keep them always true to your commandments. Keep them faithful in marriage and let them be living examples of Christian life. Give them the strength which comes from the gospel so that they may be witnesses of Christ to others. Bless them with children and help them to be good parents. May they live to see their children's children. The fourth central element is the participation in the Eucharistic sacrifice and the reception of its incomparable fruit, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. The mystery of divine love in which the spouses have been called to participate by an altogether special title, according to God's will from the beginning, is communicated most perfectly in the Eucharistic sacrifice. Listen to the words of the Catechism of the Catholic Church regarding the celebration of marriage. This is number 1621. In the Latin rite, the celebration of marriage between two Catholic faithful normally takes place during Holy Mass because of the connection of all the sacraments with the Paschal mystery of Christ. In the Eucharist, the memorial of the new covenant is realized, the new covenant in which Christ has united himself forever to the church, his beloved bride for whom he gave himself up. It is therefore fitting that the spouses should seal their consent to give themselves to each other through the offering of their own lives by uniting it to the offering of Christ for his church made present in the Eucharistic sacrifice and by receiving the Eucharist so that communicating in the same body and the same blood of Christ, they may form but one body in Christ. It is especially important that the priest emphasize both in the preparation of the couple for marriage and in the homily during the rite of marriage, the fullness of the meaning of the sacrament of holy matrimony, which is manifested in the Eucharistic sacrifice. The couple both experience the wonder of the gift of God's love in their lives by their oneness with Christ in his sacrifice and receive nourishment to live always faithfully in Christ, especially in moments of temptation and suffering. I don't take up the question of sacred music, and I underline the word sacred to be employed during the the rite of marriage. This was, in my experience as a priest, a a big challenge. Uh, And uh, uh, I remember one time, we had very strict norms, which for which I was very grateful, at the cathedral parish in La Crosse where I was serving, and so I gave them about sacred music, too, because people can have the most inappropriate uh, music. At one time, a couple wanted the, a song that they heard when they first met in some bar, and uh, <laughs> it had nothing, no sacred content to it whatsoever, and I re- refused and gave them the norms, and <laughs> the young man was very ingenious. He went around gathering booklets from Catholic marriages around the area in which this song was permitted, brought them to me, but I told him that that wasn't didn't prove the the principle wrong, and so uh, I'll just then uh, do this a uh, quick uh, part because it's getting close to our time. Uh, I have a, a section on canon law, uh, but I'll, I'll go through that a little more quickly. Uh, chapter one of Title Seven: Marriage of Part One: The Sacraments of Book Four: The Sanctifying Function of the Church the 1983 Code of Canon Law treats pastoral care and those things which must precede the celebration of marriage. It is comprised of 10 canons from Canon 1063 to 1072, which I will now treat briefly. The first, excuse me. The first of the canons, Canon 1063, provides the essential direction of the church's discipline regarding the pastoral care of the, of the married. Canon 1063 gives a general direction and then four means by which it is to be followed. The general direction reads, Pastors of souls are obliged to take care that their ecclesiastical community offers the Christian faithful the assistance by which the matrimonial state is preserved in a Christian spirit and advances in perfection. The pastoral care of the married is a principal work of the priest who provides it by engaging the whole community of the faithful. The pastoral care has two ends, 
the safeguarding of the integrity of the married state of life in accord with the word of Christ, and the fostering of the married state, so that those who are called to marriage correspond ever more perfectly to the grace received in the sacrament of holy matrimony. Among the responsibilities which belong in a special way to the pastor is the assistance at marriages and the giving of the, of the nuptial blessing. Canon 1063 continues by listing four special means by which the goals of the pastoral care of the married are to be attained. They are, one, preaching, catechesis adapted to minors, youths, and adults, and even the use of instruments of social communication by which the Christian faithful are instructed about the meaning of Christian marriage and about the function of Christian spouses and parents. Two, personal preparation to enter marriage, which disposes the spouses to the holiness and duties of their new state. Three, a fruitful liturgical celebration of marriage, which is to show that the spouses signify and share in the mystery of the unity and fruitful love between Christ and the Church. Four, help offered to those who are married, so that faithfully preserving and protecting the conjugal covenant, they daily come to lead holier and fuller lives in their family. The remote preparation for those who are called to the married state, and for all in the church who, no matter what their state in life may be, have responsibility for the care of the married, is a solid catechesis on marriage from the time of childhood and into adulthood. The proximate preparation of those called to the married state in life is given to them personally and disposes them to see the married life as their way to holiness, to eternal salvation. It also illustrates for them the particular responsibilities of the married. The immediate means of preserving the sanctity of marriage and helping the married to live ever more faithfully and generously the grace of holy matrimony is the liturgical rite, during which the couple administers to each other the sacrament of marriage by a mutual exchange of consent. For those who are married, pastoral care is directed to assist them in meeting the challenges of a lifelong faithful and procreative bond of love, especially in a totally secularized world. Such pastoral care has its inspiration in the grace of holy matrimony and remains always hopeful because of the grace which Christ never fails to give to those whom he joins together in the married life. Canon 1064 reminds the local ordinary, that would be the bishop and his equivalent, the vicar general, uh, of his responsibility to take care that such assistance is organized fittingly after he has also heard men and women proven by experience and expertise if it seems opportune. Given the fundamental importance of marriage as the first cell of the life of society and of, of the church, the local ordinary bears a most heavy burden of responsibility. Canon 1065 indicates the other sacraments which dispose the faithful to respond to the call to marriage. The sacrament of confirmation must be received before marriage so that the grace of the Holy Spirit first given in baptism is strengthened and increased for the effective witness to Christ in the world. The sacraments of penance and of the Holy Eucharist are the regular encounters with Christ by which the grace of baptism and confirmation is restored after sin and nourished by the gift of Christ's own body, blood, soul, and divinity. Special precautions. Canons 1066 to 1072 give a series of particular cautions in order that the sacrament of holy matrimony is celebrated validly and efficaciously. The pastor responsible for the preparation of the couple for marriage must make certain that nothing stands in the way of its valid and licit celebration. The pastor attains such assurance by means of a fitting investigation. Saint Canon 1067 assigns the responsibility for the establishment 
of the norms for the investigation to the Conference of Bishops and obliges pastors to follow them diligently before proceeding to witness a marriage. Canon 1068 provides for the case of danger of death and the case of an absence of proofs other than the declarations of the parties who are to marry. In such cases, the pastor is to seek the declaration of the parties that they are baptized and are prevented by no impediment. All of the faithful who are aware of an impediment are morally obliged to make them known before the celebration of marriage. If someone other than the pastor has conducted the prematrimonial investigation, then he must inform the pastor about the results as soon as possible through an authentic document. Canon 1071 lists seven situations of couples for whom the priest is not to assist at their marriage without the permission of the local ordinary. The most serious of these is the situation of a party who has notoriously rejected the Catholic faith. In such a situation, the local ordinary must make sure that the conditions for granting the permission for a marriage of mixed religion given in Canon 1125, have been fulfilled. Canon 1072 treats the case of youth who want to celebrate a marriage before the age at which a person usually enters marriage according to the accepted practices of the religion, of the region. The canonical discipline safeguards and fosters the order of the sacred liturgy so that the beauty of the reality of holy matrimony as God instituted it from the beginning, may shine forth for the salvation of the couple and for the edification of society in general. In addition, it provides a number of norms to provide as much as is humanly possible for a valid and licit celebration of the sacrament of matrimony and for an enduring and efficacious response to the grace received through the sacrament. Conclusion. It is my hope that these reflections will assist you to consider the essential elements of the pastoral care of the married so that the Church's care of those preparing for marriage and for the married may always respect the truth of the call to faithful, indissoluble, and procreative love, the call of a man and a woman to become one flesh. In concluding, I underline three essential elements of the pastoral care so needed in our time. First of all, attention must be given to a sound and complete catechesis about the sacrament of holy matrimony from the child from the time of childhood continuing into adulthood. <clears throat> While such catechesis has always been necessary, it is even more so in an age when so many contrary and false presentations of marriage are propagated by the mass media. Catechetical materials must be substantial in content assisting the catechized to come to an integral understanding of the great mystery, which is holy matrimony. Second, the order of celebrating matrimony must be followed with the greatest care. The manner of celebrating must be filled with recognition that it is Christ himself who is present to join the couple in a faithful, lifelong, and procreative union. The prematrimonial instruction of the couple should include a careful review of the order of celebrating matrimony. The homily should be carefully prepared and should center upon the grace conferred with the sacrament, indicating the various ways by which the couple will remain faithful to the grace given to them for the salvation of their souls and the edification of the entire church. The central place of the exchange of consent and the nuptial blessing, and finally of the Eucharistic sacrifice for the marriage of two Catholics, should be carefully observed. Lastly, care must be taken for the juridical structure of marriage consent and the marital life so that the Church witnesses only licit and valid celebrations of holy matrimony. The liturgical norms and the other norms of canonical discipline reflect the many centuries of the Church's experience in her pastoral care of those preparing for marriage and in her pastoral care of the married. The second revised edition of the order of celebrating holy matrimony is very much enriched 
by the norms of the 1983 Code of Canon Law. I conclude with the divinely inspired words of St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. I think this may be the third time you've heard these today, but that's no harm done. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Even so, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no man ever hates his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one. This is a great mystery and I mean in reference to Christ and the Church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Amen. Amen. (laughs) Thank you for your very kind attention. Uh, It's been a great... uh, uh, Thank you.